Hello friends and welcome to the Storyteller's Guide on Gilding Light, where we take adventure storytelling to the next level. When we think of fantasy, we often think about dragons. They are powerful and fierce creatures that have the capability to destroy entire nations. Their treasure hordes are often massive and the goal of many a quest. Dragons are ancient, intelligent creatures who have long lives and memories and are incredibly experienced in keeping their riches. I'm Satine Phoenix, your story guide for today's Storyteller's Guide episode called Here Be Dragons. Young dragons, adult dragons, ancient dragons, wormlings, drakes, dragons, dragons! In gaming in high school and we had to fight a dragon, it was usually as we were infiltrating its lair in search of booty. But there are more to dragons than just lazy lizards who sleep on coins. Today we are going to discuss the various ways to use dragons in your campaign. One of the most fun ways I've seen dragons used is as creatures who are ancient, bored, and mischievous. They are tired of living in their lairs all by themselves. They say it's lonely at the top, and these powerful creatures certainly know that feeling. As a game master, you can use dragons in your campaign as lighthearted, fun side adventures to amplify the strangeness of environment by gradually increasing the diversity of creatures encountered. The party could stumble upon a dragon who has disguised themselves as a human bard just wanting to be entertained, as James Hake did in our D&D Beyond charity game. This is a good way to lighten up a traveling slug or in a game when you're missing a player or two for the day. The idea is to think outside of the monster block box and use the dragon's abilities, actions, and layer actions in non-combat ways and more so in this alternative form. Its breath weapons can be used to heat a kettle or cool a bowl of punch. For the lair actions, consider turning things like ground to mud to a spa treatment mud bath or lightning breath to a magic show effect. If a creature of this magnitude is a high level expert at destroying, they probably have incredible control of their abilities. Subtleties go a long way in selling a con, which is what a dragon in a human suit certainly is. To further dive into the dragon's experience and control of their abilities, consider the age of the dragon to how he might treat people when disguised. A young dragon might be more cocky about their role, while an adult dragon might be more specific in their portrayal of this kind of human. And an ancient dragon might only be doing this out of necessity and survival. For more than just a one-shot, the goal of this creature's human disguise could be to infiltrate the party, to figure out their weakness and strengths through trials and observation. A dragon usually has minions, and they certainly report back to said dragon. Remember, these are intelligent creatures. The answer to a simple question can tell the dragon a lot about each party member should they want to use the party for their own gain. Not all dragons are bad. But sometimes, good dragons do bad things. In the Idle Champions event Dragon Down, a normally good aligned dragon is making trouble for the town of Luskin. Rather than setting your adventurers on a quest to bring back or kill the dragon, why not base the entire adventure around solving the mystery of why a dragon would change its temperament? In this manner, you can involve the entire town and its politics to create intense social encounters and investigative adventures, turning the adventure into a whodunit. Consider who might gain if the good dragon is removed or turned to any other alignment. Another idea for the misunderstood dragon is create an adventure that urges the players to choose sides to aid. Maybe the dragon isn't as bad as the town folks say, and in fact, it's the villagers who are terrorizing and trespassing on the dragon's land. Set up scenes that are gray to let the adventurers figure out who in fact they want to save, the hidden dragon city or the folks that claim the land nearby. Dragons don't have to fight solo. 
They could travel in packs, especially smaller dragons who might be manipulated by different sources. What kind of big baddie might own a pack of dragons? Maybe this is a higher level campaign. Imagine the look on the faces of the players when they realize the dragons belong to someone. Set up the environment to reveal they are working for someone more powerful than there's more than here that meets the eye. In another approach, think about why a group of normally solo dragons might be in a pack and what they might be protecting. There are many ways you could express this to your players so they consider the consequences of their actions. Ye old dragons, as we've come to know and love, they have a lair they live in, minions that guard it, and attacks that could melt the flesh right off your body if you're not high level enough. But who are they as sentient beings? What drives them? We've talked about this in previous episodes regarding NPCs, many of those ideas we can use with the dragon's adventures we've discussed so far. For practical purposes, in your World Anvil campaign, you can make each dragon a unique character using a World Anvil character template, and you can give them individual motivations, traits, and flaws. This will help you as a storyteller develop a deeper character to roleplay with your adventurers and let them feel like they're part of the dragon's story versus just another bad guy they must kill. You can then be prepared, not something we often get the time to do, for when you are at the game table, you can fill the story with tidbits of the dragon's loves and desires. Now that we've dabbled into ways to create adventures with dragons, let's discuss this with our special guests and begin our quests here on the Storyteller's Guide after these short videos. Hi, I'm Benwin Bronzebottom, celebrity dwarf and video game enthusiast, and this is my sidekick, Crowy. Hello. We're here to tell you about Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms, a Dungeons & Dragons-based strategy management game from Codename Entertainment. They're Canadian, so you know it's good. Let's talk about the game. Did you ever play Cookie Clicker? Of course not. This game is a management game like that, but with far more emphasis on strategy. And with a flavoring of D&D's lore and legendary heroes, you can unlock your favorite champions like Farida from Aaron M. Evans' Brimstone Angels Saga, Minsk and Boo from Baldur's Gate, and the fourth and final member of Acquisitions Incorporated, the C-Team, Amy Falcone's Walnut Dongras. The K is silent. Create the best adventuring party possible based on the formation options, your character's ability, and the obstacles and enemies you face. Or you just randomly click on things like I do and hope for the best. You can click on enemies to assist your champions, or you can set them up and walk away and let them do their thing. It's entirely up to you. I'm playing on the toilet right now. Why wouldn't you be? Idle Champions is available on all your favorite gaming platforms, including tablets, for the low, low price of free. So download it now. End with joke. You're not supposed to read it that. It says end with joke. No, we're supposed to come up with a joke to go with oh. where it says end with joke. I don't know. End with joke is pretty funny. Wait, on three. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. End, end with, with joke. joke. <laughs> I think it's funny. It's very funny. One of the biggest problems that storytellers face while in session is that when you're searching through your notes and books, you're breaking the flow of the game. World Anvil allows you to manage your lore, the stat blocks of your PCs, NPCs and monsters, your music, handouts, and so much more from a single screen. Fill your maps with lore and bring your worlds to life by connecting locations, NPCs, races, and monsters to the lands of your world with interactive maps. Track the history of your world, the adventures of your party, and all your major NPCs with timelines. World Anvil is not just for D&D 5e, it supports any other game you want, since you can build stat blocks in any system you're running and play your campaign in it, as every proper homebrew tool should aim to do. Oh. And you can make your own system, too. Create an account now at worldanvil.com and join the World Builders Guild. Use the code STORYTELLER for a whopping up to 30% off Master and Grandmaster memberships. That's worldanvil.com. Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Storyteller's Guide. We have an amazing adventure being created just for you with me today. I have Emily Rose, Dungeon Master of Rat Queens, and Ruben Bressler, Dungeon Master of the Broken Pack on the D&D channel. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks for having us. Yes. Okay, dear friends, I want to know a little bit more about you two. Well, I know a lot about you two, but I want to share you with the audience. So, Emily, 
Yes. How long have you been DMing and what kind of games do you like running? I've been DMing for about two years now, start off as many of us do as a player and then journeyed into being a DM. I ran a, I run an Oregon Trail live action show <gasps> where I am the wagon master oh and I bring goodness. people <laughs> on the Oregon Trail, I bring my improv, my improv actors on the Oregon Trail. Uh, and after I, that was actually my first kind of, I created that show before I had ever DM'd. So many friends coming up to me saying, why haven't you DM'd a game yet? Why haven't you DM'd an RPG? Uh, and then so I started DMing one shots and a bunch of little stories on Hyper RPG. And now I am the game master for the Rack Queens RPG on Hyper RPG. Uh, with stories I love to create, I love to create very, very big plot stories. I love stories with so much detail, so many hidden like little Easter eggs everywhere where if, cause I'm that kind of player, I'm always looking to everything. What does this mean? What does this mean? Why did you tell me this? And so that's the way I like to create my stories is, oh, there's tidbits of the under, there's the overall plot. And there's so many tidbits of the underlying plot. But if you, if you can catch it and if you're close and if you're like listening yeah. close enough, you're going to pick them up. Cool. Ruben? I have been DMing for a very long time, uh, since college, maybe high school. Um, I grew up in a household where Dungeons and Dragons was second nature and nerd things was second nature. My parents played D&D together before they started dating. Aww, so I, I, I grew so up in that environment. <laughs> um, but I only started DMing once I started doing uh, theater. And so it sort of became a theater exercise in college. Um, it, I sort of fell away from it, you know, hobbies, growing up, doing all the different types of things that you do, but I came back to it with uh, the Broken Pact and combining Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons together, uh, and now I uh, am the Dungeon Master or the Guild Master oh, for okay. Ravnica the Broken Pact on Saving Throw Show and D&D. Um, I tend to, I love the Easter eggs, I love the big plot stuff, I'm not as good with it. I need a lot of help with all of the things that are tying the world together. I'm really interested in the weird characters and the in the moment, bizarre, third, you know, the, the, the people that you spend 15 minutes with, mm -hmm. the strange shop, the weird guide, the tavern keeper's assistant, like that odd corner with it, you think about two weeks from now and you think that had nothing to do with the plot but that's what i remember and yeah. that's what i really like about it is is carving out these little niches in the world so i'm gonna lay the ground rules for the adventure creation today are you ready as ready as i'll ever be i guess okay on. so level five characters adventure has to be between three and four hours and you have to build an adventure around dragons the whole thing is to get the, how do you convince players not to kill dragons? And I want you to design a game around that. And also the location, because of our wonderful partners at Idle Champions, the location is Luskin. If you don't know Luskin, Luskin's way up in the north. Think of the north. Sure. Um, and it is also a seaside town. Okay. Yes. So way north, snowy, way cold. Right. Mm -hmm. So is it is it mountainous or like fjords kind of north or is it yes. flat land? Mm, yes. Okay. I mean, fjords. Doesn't, doesn't we'll do fjords. We'll do yeah. fjords. That works. Okay. You're ready to make this adventure. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a very short amount of time. So ready, go. All right. All right. So we're starting. I, I tend to, when we're coming up with this kind of adventure, I like to start at the end. What is the goal that we want the players to reach? Are we hoping that, the, now we're, we're going with dragons here. Do we want them to slay the dragons? Do we want them to steal something from the dragons? Do we want them to meet the dragons for some reason? We're supposed to, we're supposed to convince our players not to kill the dragons, right? Yeah, so right. leaving that end of the yeah. story. I think then that the end goal needs to be um, maybe not a physical, something that you was is physically obtained, but something that is mentally obtained, a lesson that is learned, perhaps with a physical thing along the way. Perhaps we had the misconception of the dragons all along. Perhaps that's the end goal. And then throughout the journey is these kind of moments where, oh, these people who are leading you on this quest, the people mm -hmm. who tell you to go slay these horrible dragons were actually the villains all along. Okay. <gasps> I like that. <laughs> okay. I like that angle of it. So 
I mean, I'm going to use a Dungeons and Dragons um, uh, motif here and go with. I, I really like the confusion element of misidentifying mm -hmm. what the dragon represents and who they are, particularly because dragons can become humans. Some of them can become humanoids. And so my initial thought is to have a dragon that typically spends most of its time in humanoid form and have Ooh. that sort of be the twist it, that leads into act three, probably. Oh, are they, like, are they like, are they like, they join up with the party kind of maybe a little third yeah. of the first third and then they start to befriend this person and perhaps they're all like, oh, we gotta go kill this dragon and this person's kind of like, yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sure. Maybe they're, they're the guide taking them to the mountain where the oh, dragon gosh, lives, yeah. right? So let's, let's, let's explore that. Let's say that they get hired by a guild in town. Okay to go take back a cave that a dragon took. This horrible dragon horrible that's gonna, dragon. it's eating all the sheep, yep. it's, it's terrorizing the town. Right, uh, and so they start making their way up into the hills and XYZ, they get to a Sherpa person and the Sherpa takes them to where they need to go and then ta-da, Sherpa is the dragon. The dragon. Oh, hmm. that's great. I'm just, cause like one of the big things I do as a, as a GM and a storyteller is I think one of the most, one of the best things you can do is pull from what you know. Cause if you, the stories that you love will inspire you. So the whole time I'm sitting here thinking about this, I'm thinking about one of my favorite films, How to Train Your Dragon. Yes. So I'm like, and I'm like, I love that relationship. I love the relationship to uh, mm -hmm. uh, Toothless and Hiccup. So I'm trying to like, not necessarily copy that, but in my mind, I'm like, okay, what are the kind of the cores of that relationship? What do I love so much about those characters? How can I reimagine this into, our story. Yeah. Maybe there's like a baby dragon in there too. Sure. What's like a mom and a baby dragon? Oh, Sherpa with baby. Sherpa with baby. Okay, so um, <laughs> what I'm hearing from you guys is this three acts. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. They start off in town, then there's a journey, and then they make their way into the into the place yeah. they need to go to. So let's go in and start dissecting the first act. Great. So first act. Town. Town. Information gathering. Creative, like super fun NPCs, yep. a variety of characters that the. I think that's what I love about towns. I love creating towns because I love having my players just go, who do you want to talk to? Right. Let's improvise this, let's create this, let's build this town together. Yeah, I also like the aspect of showcasing the different personalities that a town can have. Maybe the group that's hiring the party is super anti dragon. But then you find some other group that's like, eh, they don't bother us, we don't bother them, or something else along those lines. Yeah. And another really fun place to put those unique world building aspects um, for, for a location that's super unique, this, what was Luskin. Yes. And, um, you know, you can, you can have, you know, pelt traders or someone who might have specific knowledge of where they're going. Or even maybe like a barbarian or a warrior, sure. a fighter who is retired, who once tried to take on this dragon and has like a story from it, but then are they actually telling the truth? Is, yeah. You don't, who can you trust? I really like building stories from a foundation of who can you actually trust. I think that having um, a distrustful um, person that hires the party is a fun place to start with because then, then the players, even though they're on this adventure and they know that you know there's, there is an end goal here, they know something hinky is going on. Mm -hmm. They're okay. waiting for the twist. So what, who is this person? Why, why say yes to this person over anyone else in town? Hmm. I think where my gut is telling me to go is um, especially something we need to, I think there's two goals with this. This person needs to convince the players mm -hmm. how important this mission is, how deadly this dragon is. Um, this per whoever is setting up on this mission believes that they're doing good. It's never a malice thing. A villain always believes that they are doing what is best. That's the best kind yeah. of villain. So this person believes that what they're doing is right. Uh, and sometimes I like to, to I, what I like to build too is uh, NPCs who have relationships with your, your current players at the table. Sure. So is this a cousin? Is this an uncle? Or is this a, a longtime friend that this one person at the table can trust and will then say, hey everybody, 
it gives them kind of character motivation and story motivation and improv motivation to go along with uh, what I, what we are as the GMs and the DMs encouraging them to do. Right. If that Let's makes sense. No, totally does. Let's start establishing this. We've got about 20 minutes to do this whole thing. Sure. Great. Yeah. So I think that there's there's so much room here for for misdirection and fog. Um, something I, I wanted to plant so that we can hint at it later is mm -hmm. that um, white dragons and silver dragons are very similar and they live in the same environment, icy snow mountains, and silver dragons are good and white dragons are bad. So maybe Ooh. they get hired to take care of a white dragon and then they <laughs> get there and it's actually a silver dragon. Oh, I love that. So that's, that's a... That's a twist that we can throw at the players, <laughs> especially if they have some amount of dragon lore mm -hmm. in mind. They can be like, this doesn't seem like a white dragon behavior. And then they can start doing weird oh. checks like that. And then Perfect. they can find that out through the journey. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Another thing I really like doing, particularly in Dungeons and Dragons, but in all role-playing games that have these wide skill sets is using the underused skills. Um, animal handling is my favorite skill to throw at my players in Dungeons and Dragons because it's the least used skill. And so when you find an opportunity to throw dragon lore or tracking mm -hmm. or really niche subjects like that, particularly in an adventure like this, um, I think that you just have to dive in and, and uh, take full advantage. Cool. Okay, so we have an overall uh, view of it. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. Great. Who is this person? Right. Why? Give me the why. Right. Who is the why? Yeah. How do we kick this off? So there is the traditional, you just get hired to do this thing, and maybe the person doesn't know any better. But I liked your plan better of this is someone who doesn't have the right picture. They, their their um, intentions are good. They perhaps mm -hmm. thought that the dragon, you know, Lord of the Rings style, kicked out their family from their ancestral home, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, but in fact, it is some other, some, something else has happened. Personal. Yeah. yeah, it's personal. It's personal. Okay, so we'll say that this is the, this person is the cousin. Yeah. So it's a cousin to somebody in the adventure. And, you know, even going to, you can make this adventure have pre-made characters. Mm -hmm. Sure. So that'll make it easier. Yeah. Right? Okay, so it's the person's cousin, a uh, barbarian's cousin, whoever this person is. And they are, uh, they're trying to get you to overtake or take care of, I'm not clear. I think it's, I think it's probably, it's clear out. It's probably clear out. I think that we can definitely just play off of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, eliminate like, that threat, yeah, eliminate just, the threat. Just okay. get us our ancestral home back, you can even sing the song, and just play off of that colloquialism. All right, who is this person? Race. Class, name, dwarf. dwarf. Gotta be a dwarf, right? Dwarf. dwarf. Dwarf barbarian. Dwarf barbarian. In the north. In the north. Klaus von Stronoff. Klaus von Stronoff. <laughs> okay. Love it. Um, retired, former adventurer. Missing an eye. Missing an eye, oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. And super proud. Maybe not super old, but just over it, yeah. you know. Um, and I think too, I think uh, someone, a character that no one has told him that he is wrong his entire life. Right. Always believes that he has the best intentions of everyone and always believes that what he is doing is right. Yeah. And being a former adventurer has just gold that he has nothing to do with. Like, what's he going to do with it? So he's going to hire some folks to go take care of this other problem, get his uncle's house back and hires these new adventurers to go take care of the issue. All right, so the house is up in this location. Yeah, the, the, the cave is an ancestral home. Okay, cool. Ooh, yeah, it's yeah, like part of their land. land. Yeah, awesome. I would like it. Okay, and then you have weather because mm -hmm. you're up there. They have to brave through the cold, the journey from this town to that location. Okay, so you've given them the quest. They have to go do the thing. They get X amount of cash. And what is the issue in the journey? The, that um, from what I hear, they it's revealed about the dragon. This person told you lies. It's revealed about this dragon on the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want Klaus to not be purposefully misleading. 
right? Right. But by the end of this, we want the party to both like Klaus and the dragon. Ooh, yeah. Because cousin. Right. Because cousin, yeah. Can't can't break that bond. So Okay. I think then, yeah, you play this character can't be from the get-go. It's gotta be an understandable look. I'm just taking back what is mine. Yeah. Yeah. So so we can stick with the guide idea. Perhaps a they start going on the journey and it starts snowing super heavy and they get caught in a storm or ice breaks underneath them and a mysterious stranger appears out of the flurries and <laughs> helps them through this and then joins their cadre and leads them to where yes. they need to go. Um, oh, provides them shelter. Provides mm -hmm. them shelter. Come back to my my abode. Yes. Um, yes. We can certainly help. And then they arrive, and turns out this is the thing that they're going, they're looking for. I think that that might be the, the, I love the it. avenue. Mm -hmm. And then and, perhaps the conversation on the way up reveals a lot. Yeah, I want to say definitely as they start to make their way out of town, they're prop perhaps is one encounter yes. that kind of starts the uh, it starts to it's the first kind of. Mm, Something might be a little awry. What is that encounter? I want to say that, um, I want to say you have your party walking through, kind of going through the gates of town, and you overhear these two, uh, two women talking. And you just, you can try oh, to overhear uh, the conversation. The GM can give like a little tidbit of like, as you walk through, you start to hear mumblings of this conversation. And it's like one or two lines. And then your party can be like, oh, well, we want to go talk to them. They're talking about the dragon. Maybe they know about the dragon. And then these two women start to kind of play into well, it's not, he, he's, he's really into, he's, Klaus is, is super about, we appreciate he, that he wants to protect this town. Uh, yes, a white dragon is very, very terrifying. It is a big threat, but uh, I don't know. We just feel something where they start, the townspeople start to feel unsure, which then will, uh, NPCs are great uh, lead ways into how your character should feel. NPCs yeah. are great ways for GMs to set the tone. So then your players right. can start to be like, oh, well, Maybe. I don't know. Something not as obvious as that. I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. That's good. That and? So, so that would I, be I definitely like beginning. planting the Rashomon kind of seeds of this person, you know, you can look at it at different facets and mm -hmm. have different opinions. Like, sure, it's dangerous, but it hasn't attacked us yet, so who cares? Kind of deal. Once they're on the path, a combat encounter that you can have in an ice storm or a snowstorm, you can spring a giant, perhaps, oh, yeah. a, 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 a frost giant. That's a bit much, probably, uh, in D&D for some fifth level characters, but... Maybe a wind elemental? Wind elemental would be oh, great. Right. That's Air good. elemental is a great one. Um, you could... Something along the lines of uh, Bahir, um, like hiding in the mountains. Those are my favorite. Yeah, I like Bahirs a lot, too. That still might be a little tough. Um, but yeah, there's something along those lines. I really like Air elemental a lot, actually, because it fits in with the wind aspect. Um, and it's, it's something... preventing them. And maybe this um, air elemental is trying to protect the dragon. Sure. And, and maybe so... people in the town are misinterpreting misinterpreting this wind this protective wind elemental as the dragon as itself. The dragon. Boom. Yes. Because no one wants to go, no one dares go up there. Oh, the people who have gotten close, oh, mm, it's that dragon. Right. Yeah, okay. they've gotten caught up in this big windstorm. Yeah. I like that. That's so great. we've got the uh, interaction with some townsfolk. You make your way up, there's this air elemental protecting the dragon. Do they find out that it's protecting the dragon? Is there a, a give that you want to, uh, they don't have to, but I don't also- know. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I want them to yet. Okay. And then they're caught in this, like maybe avalanche or I wanna something. Yeah, I wanna and say that- the Sherpa comes in. Right. I wanna say that at the end of that battle, maybe the wind elemental is not necessarily killed. Right. Instead, it kind of in a fury, a flurry fury, yeah. uh, <laughs> creates a huge kind of as it escapes, as it's terrified and like has the closest it's been to being defeated, creates this huge storm, snowstorm, or yeah, creates this huge avalanche. But then the Sherpa, then our heroes get trapped. The Sherpa emerges. Hey, let me help you out. What are you doing out here? This right. is dangerous. Yeah, I definitely don't want to rob the players of the of the kill you know you, you true, certainly yeah. have the aspect of you know i i want to hit the last hit point so if you just have the air elemental sort of dissipate into the wind that's really satisfying as a storyteller mm. perhaps not as satisfying for the players mm -hmm. so i want to balance that i like the aspect of the air elemental sort of going away 
but I want to balance that. Well, if you with... leave something, right? So what is it? Oh, Why sure. do they want to kill it? Usually they want to kill it so they can get something. That's true. So maybe it leaves something behind versus killing. Versus a body. I mean, what kind of sure. body does the air elemental have? Exactly. It could leave behind, so there's the, I think it's like a sensor of air air elemental control, or oh, whatever, yeah, the yeah. item that makes an air elemental. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just out there, just by accident. Has nothing to even do with the dragon, but it's on the path. And so they've been mistaking it for the dragon because normal townsfolk aren't going to be able to deal with an air elemental. Yeah. That could be a way to handle that. A really cool, maybe um, the sensor itself has dragons engraved on it. Yes. And that'll give a little bit of a, 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 an idea. But it's like dragons carved in a very, very, not in a terrifying way. It's like right. a very beautiful, soft, almost like yeah. admirational. And that handles carving. both issues because they're able to finish the monster. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they're maliciously doing it. It's It was a product of this device, which I really like. Yeah, cool. So a they're caught in this on the mountain. The Sherpa comes in. They have an interaction. What are some tidbits you can enter into this this scene that will kind of give them information about what's about to happen when they get up? Like some clues to kind of get their brains questioning the purpose of them going up there. I think it's very easy to sew. Um confusion and plant the idea in their head that this is normal. Like if this is just a person who just happens upon this very dangerous situation and they seem totally fine by themselves, that should trigger alarm bells. So starting from that point, I think that you can sprinkle in, I'm not an expert on how different dragons behave as humans, but you can certainly sprinkle in how a silver dragon might behave. I like the idea too. I think there's nothing more disarming, alarming, and charming than uh, a, a kind of a, a quirky old person. Mm -hmm. And I think because then there, then it's like, are they telling the truth? Like, what is their whole guilt deal? Why were they just wandering out in the in the snow? And it's this quirky old woman, perhaps. And uh, she's like, well, yeah, da, 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 just rambling off. And everyone's like, okay, thank you yeah. for bringing us to your home. We appreciate it, but. And then you find out, yeah, that this is just who a this dragon is. A silver-haired yes. dragon lady. Yep. I like that. That's awesome. My favorite villain NPCs, and in this case it's not a villain, but my favorite villain NPCs are creatures that can turn into humanoids and disarm you in that way. Things like Oni, mm -hmm. dragons, hags. Um, my first instinct would be, oh, that's a hag. Immediately. I would see old lady alone yeah, in the wilderness. You have to worry about hag. preconceived notions. That's true. Right. So if you change her appearance a little bit, so maybe you don't describe her as like you would a hag, you would actually describe her like a Sherpa person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that sounds Lots really weird. Lots of furs. <laughs> um, I'm picturing like a super long silver braid. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that symbolically would be the Tail, tail. Mm -hmm. but like huge, like super thick, maybe even a, uh, maybe this is an old dwarf lady Ooh. to sort of oh, play off of like the dwarf that, yeah. in town, dwarf in the mountain. And it'll take away from the idea that, oh, this is a hag, because your players will always try to guess yep. what something is. Okay, they've had that conversation. Um, give me three tidbits of information that might sway them. We've got like seven minutes left. Okay, um, uh, she starts to ask him, tell me, does any, has anyone in this town seen this, like, oh, what have they told you about this dragon? She starts to inquire, like, this, oh, yes, to, oh, I really haven't seen a dragon up here. Can you tell me what to look out for? Mm -hmm. Like, kind of, like yeah. That. Yeah, <laughs> fishing for information. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. I think that um, if there is a, either a dwarf or a dragonborn in the party, uh, and they immediately latch on to that character, um, particularly if it's someone who's not the cousin. The cousin in town, it already had their sort of role play yeah. moment in the first portion. Maybe there's something different about a ranger 
or something else. You find some tidbit to latch onto. Oh, you're an outlander as well. Where are you from? How have you managed in the wilderness? Maybe they share a type of instrument that they play mm -hmm. or, or something along those lines and just try to dig into their personality. Um, trying to associate a common bond before they get to where they're going. That's awesome. I think that a lot of the context clues are going to come into focus once they get to where they're going. Once they get to the cave and see a dragon lair, I would assume, in a former dwarven stronghold, mm -hmm. um, would, would certainly tip them off. I think a fun bit of tidbit information too, what is this dragon hoard? I love it when dragons hoard things. Because oh, yes, I think that's much more of a personality and it adds to them as a character. They're not just its creature, they're a character. I think, yeah, as soon as they come on, maybe it's hinted what this dragon hoards when they're on their way there. Perhaps she's like, oh, I, would, I love tea. Huge, I'm like, oh, would you like some tea? I have, you wouldn't believe all the different kinds of tea I have. I can make you any kind of tea you want. And that's what she, this is what this dragon hoards is tea. Yeah. And so there's a huge fire, maybe with like a huge <laughs> kettle and there's all these different like jars and, and vases and collections of tea. That's yeah. cool because then she can actually um, be the dragon a little bit and kind of inquire what kind of tea they have or mm -hmm. what kind of herbs have they found on, in their journeys. Right. You know, and that gives uh, kind of like foreshadowing what they might find. And then they can put the pieces together. Okay, so you've made it all the way to the top. And you've gotten into the Dwarven Stronghold, which is now a dragon's den. Mm -hmm. They get there. How do we reveal? How is it revealed that she's a dragon? I'm hoping the players just blurt it out, and then she goes, you got me, or, or whatever the <laughs> reveal on those things in that line would be. Mm -hmm. But if they don't figure it out, it does need to be revealed in some way. I think, uh... I think a fun way to do this would be uh, this, this dragon lady to be like, let me get the kettle going. And then she turns into a dragon. <laughs> I like that. Very, like, I'm picturing almost like this female Anthony Hopkins-esque moment that's like, mm-hmm. Uh, and just this, this transformation and then the party, yeah, if they haven't, if they haven't put the clues together yet, or like, oh gosh, and it's, and we keep describing, yeah, you see this silver dragon in front of you. And then of course someone in the party will be like, wait, where's the, a white dragon, or you, you're not a white dragon, and then that whole uh, conversation can be held as well. Uh, hell, take it. Yeah. Talked about it as well. <laughs> right. So at that point, it becomes a convince the benevolent silver dragon to vacate its current lair, which is going to be a lot of persuasion, um, mm -hmm. perhaps some deal making. Uh, perhaps uh, if you have a, a particularly trigger happy group, maybe they try to fight, but that's probably ill advised. But you have lots of avenues from that. Yeah, so what do we do in this game to maneuver? What kind of clues do we give them to maneuver them away from killing? Because that's the point of our adventure, is to figure ways around that. Right. I think engendering the party to this NPC that they meet is going to go a long way. Um, I think that, you know, this 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 dragon, we still need to name our dragon. Oh, we do! Our Ooh. silver dragon. I name. love, one thing I love to do as a GM is, is give uh, characters uh, very specific names that are based off of who they are, but in like either Nordic languages or like Celtic languages or different languages, it just... So I'm feeling like uh, perhaps one of the old Norse words for like silver or something or, yeah. and playing, like taking that word and then adding uh, a dwarven kind of uh, flavor to it. Flavor yeah. to it, yeah. I like that. Um, now, which her real name, would her human name and her dragon name, is it too obvious to name her Sylvestra or something? I think, I think Sylvestra is, is, is pretty, I yeah. feel like I wouldn't assume that immediately. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that works. Especially think... since they're looking for a white dragon. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Once, once they put it together that they're looking for, that the white dragon is the silver dragon and they make those, those connections, then Sylvestra becomes more obvious. But because we've been hiding the ball this whole time, perhaps they won't figure that out. But it is another nice lore, uh, uh, drop for them to sort of see that they're not everything is as it seems here. cool okay last bit how what am i gonna 
asking you guys. We made the adventure together. So what is it that the, the dragon would want to leave? Uh, definitely wants the sensor. Mm -hmm. It has the air elemental in it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just wants some nice tea. Maybe wants more tea. Wants to know where to find more tea. Yeah. Find more tea and perhaps, uh, and two, uh, maybe maybe the dragon can ask, if you can convince those people like not to, not to be afraid of me, not to not to judge me, or just yeah. to, to immediately want to attack me. I just want to live here. I'm sorry I came into someone's home. Of course it's a little rude. Uh, didn't know somebody else had already staked claim on it. But yeah, I think too, uh, just promise me that you will help them know that I did never, I never wanted to hurt them, and, and I hope that they would never want to hurt me if they knew who I was. Beautiful! That is our <laughs> adventure! What is it called? Dun dun dun! Um, what is our adventure called? Fury in the Flurries? That's or it! Fury in the, it Fury, Fury in the Fjord. Fury in the Fjord. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for being here and creating Fury in the Fjord. <laughs> I can't I even like say that, that That's right? A <laughs> uh, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you on the internet? Of course, uh, you can find me at frankly underscore Emily on Twitter and with an extra underscore on Instagram. And you can also find me regularly on Hyper RPG on Tuesday nights with Blood Curling Tales uh, in time. And Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific time is the Rat Queens RPG. Oh, hi there. I'm the internet's M-O-X-R-E-U-B-Y, Mox Ruby. You can follow me <laughs> everywhere at that. Uh, you can catch me on Ravnica the Broken Pact, which is the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica show on uh, the D&D Twitch and YouTube channels. And you can also catch me on Friday nights for these Wyhonder RPG Black Hearts on the Encounter Roleplay Network. And as always, I'm Sateen Phoenix. You can find me on the internet at Sateen Phoenix. Thank you so much to our partners, Idol Champions, and our sponsor, World Anvil. You guys are amazing. Tell all the stories, and we will see you next time here on the Storyteller's Guide. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the Storyteller's Guide here on Gilding Light. Please, in the comments, tell us how you use the hero's journey in your stories. Send us links to your questionnaires that you ask. Let's start the conversation and learn from each other. Thanks again. See you next time on the Storyteller's Guide.